When I was 10 years old, my family and I, we went on a cross-country trip. How many of you have been on a cross-country trip? Raise your hand. So most of you in the room have, and so therefore all of you know that the cool part about a cross-country trip are the destinations, right? You know, you, got to, you, you get to go to Mount Rushmore, get to go to um, the Grand Canyon, Glacier National Park, all these cool places. You get to go to Seattle, etc. What's like the not best part of the, these cross-country trips? The driving, yeah. <laughs> the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of driving that you have to endure as you're trying to get to the destination. Now, when I was growing up, I was not one of those kids who was blessed with a Game Boy. Um, I was not. That was so far from what my, what my parents wanted for me. Um, so when we went on our cross-country trip, I remember they took us to the Dollar Tree and they said, okay, you can get one toy to like keep you, keep you um, engaged the entire trip. And we went from New Jersey, um, like a zigzag up and down to all the national parks, all the way to Seattle. Like this was a serious trip. We were gone for a month, guys. And so I went to the Dollar Tree and I remember I got this little like basketball the thing it was like you un you folded it and then you unfolded it and then you flicked the little basketball and it shot it into the hoop so that was fun for like 13 seconds <laughs> um, but I just remember being so bored on this trip just so bored and so I would sit like leaning my head against the window just like staring and there's some parts of that trip that are just monotonous boring for hundreds of hours. Like you go through Wyoming, you go through South Dakota, and you're just like, okay, I guess I'll count the fence posts again. <laughs> wow, there's a cow. Okay, let's count cows now. But I remember there was one stretch of the trip where all this changed. I remember we drove through South Dakota which South Dakota is another one of those states where it's like, there's a whole lot of nothing for a whole lot of time. But I remember going into, driving through South Dakota, I got my head against the window, and I look out the window, and I see this sign. And it says, wall drug, free ice water. And I remember seeing that. <clears throat> I remember seeing that sign and just thinking to myself, wait, what? Free ice water. Like, ice water is free everywhere. You can go to McDonald's and get free ice water. This isn't a big deal. Wall drug, what is that? But before I could even, like, complete the thought in my brain, there's another sign. And another. And another. And another. And another. And another. And another. For hundreds of miles, people, every quarter of a mile, every half a mile, there, is, there are signs on I-90 in South Dakota pointing us to this magical place called Wall Drug. Every half a mile, every quarter of a mile, it's like it's inescapable. And so finally, like, you know, my 10-year-old mind, I'm like, wow, look at all this cool stuff. I saw a dinosaur at one point. Are there dinosaurs there? And so after seeing enough of these signs, we've, after seeing enough of these things, you know, my family is just like, okay, well, we got to see this for ourselves. Like, there's got to be something there. Like, this is cool. All right. Have any of you ever been to Wall Drug? Yeah, Larry. Larry. <laughs> so we drive the full 200 miles. There's 200 miles of signs. The first of signs. The first sign you see is Wall Drug, 201 miles away, and then you get closer and closer and closer. So we drive the full 200 miles. We pass all 333 signs, people. I looked it up. There's 333 signs. They spend $300,000 on advertising just on billboards a year. And then we pull over in Wall, South Dakota, which is in the middle of Podunk, nowhere. And we walk in the front doors. 
And it's a good time. Like, it's fun. You know, it's for kids. It's, it's definitely a tourist trap. It's not Disneyland, okay? Just, just set your expectations where they should be. But there's like a 10-foot-tall jackalope that's like, oh, this is so cool. We can climb on it as a kid. There's, um, there's all these animatronic cowboy stuff. They're all like doing their little dances, rodeo. They have the biggest gift shop ever so many bumper stickers so many like you know those mood ring things like it's garbage but it's it's fun for a kid and then the pa stay resistance for this place is they have i don't even know how they got this like where did this come from but they have like a 20 foot tall animatronic T-Rex that must have fallen off the truck on the way to Universal Studios or something because it does not belong at Wall Drug, but it's there. It's this like amazing T-Rex. You like walk up to it and it's, it's like a ride at, at Universal Studios. And as a kid, it's really awesome. It's, really, it's a really cool stop on the road of monotony that is South Dakota. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. We would have never, my family would have never stopped in Wall, South Dakota. We would have never stopped at Wall Drug had we not seen those signs. We would have driven right by. We would have never known it even existed if we hadn't have seen those signs, sign after sign after sign after sign. And this is what the gospel is like to many unbelievers. The good news of Jesus Christ is something that unbelievers can just drive by. They can just pass by on the road of life. You know, they're busy. I got, I got a lot of stuff going on. What even is that? What's the gospel? I don't really care. I'm busy. I got places to be. But do you know how good our God is? how loving the Father is because he has set up signs for them. He has set up signs for the unbelievers, pointing them to him and showing them who he is. Please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And I'm backtracking a little bit, because Pastor Garen preached on this a couple weeks ago, but it's important to get the whole thing in perspective if we're going to be talking about this today. So Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Verse 12, they stood there amazed and perplexed, and they said, what can this mean? What does this sign mean? They asked each other. So notice the sign. Notice the sign on the side of the road. 120 believers start speaking in unknown start speaking in different languages and yet every single person who comes to hear thousands of people hear them they hear them as if they are all speaking their native tongue so the people from Italy they hear these 120 people speaking Italian yet at the same time these people from, oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of the places that existed back then. This didn't, but whatever. The people from, from Russia are listening, to the, are listening to these group of 120, and they're speaking in Russian. That's how this miracle worked. And this spectacle 
Because it would have been a spectacle. This is an incredible moment. This is a wonder. This is a sign. This spectacle caused all these men and women to come running. They dropped what they were doing. They left the path they were on and said, what is going on here? I got to know. I got to figure this out. I got to know. What is wall drug? We got, what is this? What is going on here? Well, you know, most of them. Verse 13 says that um, others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, ah, they're just drunk. They're just drunk. They're just a bunch of lushes. Which is very interesting because these men and women who are accusing the disciples of being drunk are experiencing the exact same miracle that the rest of the people are. They're experiencing the same miracle in the same way as the others, but their hearts are so full of unbelief that they discount the miracle and even make fun of the disciples. But you know what? And this is what I love about Peter. It doesn't phase him. It doesn't, it doesn't phase the apostle Peter. Verse 14, it says, Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd and said, Listen carefully. All of you, pay attention. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. Do not get the wrong idea. Do not discount what is happening right here. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel who said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy, prophesy and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and the glorious day of the Lord arrives. And this part is really critical. But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter explains that what's happening right now, this incredible sign of these men and women speaking in tongues, this incredible wonder being given to them, this has always been God's plan. This has always been God's plan. Because God is setting up signs and wonders to point unbelievers back to him. This has always been God's modus operandi. This is how God works. He is using miraculous signs, miraculous wonders to point those who don't believe back to him. We see it back in like the time of Egypt. In Exodus 7. I'll just I'll I'll read it for you. Exodus 7 says Sorry, I don't have this on the screen. You have to pay attention. Verse 3, I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can, this is God speaking, I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. And when I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Egyptians, bring out the, sorry, when I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So very interesting here. We know that the Lord, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. And the Lord drew them out of Egypt through this like 
big showdown between Pharaoh and God where, where God like performed so many plagues and miracles and signs and wonders to prove I am God, you are not, let my people go. And so God's purpose behind that was to save and rescue his people from Egypt, but a secondary purpose behind this whole, this whole battle between Israel and Egypt was so God could say to the Egyptians, I am the Lord, come to me, come to me. And I believe that through these plagues, through these signs and wonders, Egyptians were saved. Egyptians were brought to the Lord because anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what he says. Amen? Amen. Amen. I have no idea where I am, but that's okay. <laughs> God is setting up signs and wonders to point unbelievers back to him. He's setting up signs himself in blood and fire and clouds of smoke, the sun darkening, the moon turning blood red. But he's also setting up signs and wonders through us. And the ones that are mentioned here are prophecy, visions, and dreams. And God declares, all who see and hear these signs and call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because that has always been his goal. That has always been his heart, to draw the unbeliever back to himself. To draw humanity back to himself. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and Peter's just getting started. As I'm fading, Peter's just getting started. Acts 2, 2, verse 22. Peter continues, People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With, and here's where he digs the knife in. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in his grip. God, verse 32, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Did you know there are over 500 witnesses of Jesus' resurrection? how Jesus died on the cross, ever, like a bunch of people saw him die, but over 500 people witnessed him in the resurrection, saw him come back, felt him, touched his scars, and knew for certain he is real. We are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. So Peter explains that Jesus' ministry, Jesus' ministry, was also characterized by what? By signs and wonders that were used to point people back to God. He, we know that he healed the sick, the blind, and the lame. He delivered men and women from the influence of demons. He fed thousands of people with just a few like food scraps. And he even raised multiple people from the dead. But the greatest miracle, <clears throat> the greatest miracle that Jesus accomplished happened in his resurrection. Yep. Happened in his resurrection. So Peter says to these people, so even though you people killed him, you know, he really digs the knife in and you know, turns it a little bit. Even though you people killed Jesus, God redeemed Jesus' death by bringing about the greatest sign the world had ever seen, the resurrection. The resurrection which proved once and for all that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, that Jesus' words and deeds are all true. The resurrection proved that. They've been, all of Jesus' words and deeds were validated by the Father. Because when Jesus, if Jesus were to die and then just stay dead, 
then there would be doubt as to who Jesus was. Because Jesus said a lot of things. He, Jesus, you know, we, we kind of take for granted nowadays. We call, we call God Father all the time. That was not okay back in the day. It was not all right to just call the God Father. In fact, um, Jesus got in trouble with the Pharisees quite a bit because of this. Jesus said a lot of weird things. He said, like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to get to, to, to heaven, the only way to get to the Father is through me. So if Jesus were to just die and not come back, then it would call into question every single thing that he had said in our Bible and, and around. But because Jesus was raised, we have an assurance that everything he said and everything he did was true, including that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It is as if the Father put his own stamp of approval upon Jesus' entire life and ministry and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And that is what he did. And the resurrection finally proved that Jesus has power over death. So that as Jesus died and, raised, and was raised again, so we will also die, but be raised to new life in Christ. So these signs accomplished through Jesus were purposed by God to point unbelievers back to himself. So that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, anyone calls on the, who calls on the name of Jesus would be saved. Now, are you starting to understand the heart of the Father in this? He is willing to go to great lengths to perform miraculous signs and miraculous wonders, some be difficult for him, like the death of his son. He's willing to allow that to happen. All for what? to draw unbelievers back to himself. He's willing to do whatever it takes to draw those who would normally, they'd be just driving down the road. He's setting up signs in their path so that they can come to him. So that they can come to him. That's the deep, deep love of the Father. Verse, 20, verse 37. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. It says that Peter's words pierced their hearts, pierced the hearts of the people who were listening. And they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And I just want to pause there with that sentence. Brothers, what should we do? Because if we look at the story, we see that the signs and the wonders of the day, they did their part, right? They pointed the unbelievers to God. They, in fact, they went before them and and softened their hearts and turn the hearts of these people toward God. It let them know, hey, there's something missing in your life. There's something missing in your life. But the job's not done yet. The day wasn't done yet. Because the, what the signs showed them was there's something missing. But they don't yet know what's missing yet. They don't know what what the thing that's missing is. And so Peter continues, and he tells them. They said, brothers, what do we need to do? And he says, Peter replies, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The simple gospel message. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. All who have been called by the Lord our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves 
from this crooked generation. And those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. 3,000. 3,000. So when I look at this passage, here's what I see. There's an incredible sign and wonder that's given to them. This, this 120 people speaking in tongues. And that sign causes 3,000 people to turn away from what they're doing. It draws their attention away from their normal status quo and focuses them. It says, what is going on? Like, this is not normal. God is doing something amazing. And it points them towards God and it points them towards the believers. But the job is not done. The job is not complete until the believers share the gospel with the unbelievers. So the sign is only a sign if it's not accompanied by something else. Can you imagine if me and my family, (coughs) (coughs) me and my family, we went on this cross-country trip. Thank you. We went on this cross-country trip, and we went through the 200 miles and saw sign after sign after sign after sign. And then we arrived in Wall, South Dakota, and there was nothing there. That would have been a big bummer. (laughs) It's a lot of hype for nothing. Well, guess what? That's what happens when there's a sign, when there's a wonder, and there's no gospel message. What was the point? I guess they 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 know that a God is powerful. They don't know who that God is. They don't know that it's Jesus. They don't know that he died for your, their sins. They don't know what they need to do to become a Christian. And so at the end of the day, they've just seen some cool signs. But the purpose of the signs is to lead people to God. But we need to be able to share the gospel. God is setting up signs and wonders to point unbelievers back to him. But it is up to believers to share the gospel message that will actually save them. And sometimes, I don't think we really understand the purpose of signs and wonders. Sometimes I think that we get, you know, as Christians, we can get caught up in our own unbelief. And we start seeking signs and wonders not for unbelievers to draw them to Christ, but we start seeking signs and wonders to help our own unbelief. God, if you could just prove to me that you're real, if you could just do something big right now, then I won't have these doubts in my heart anymore. God, if you could just heal me, if you could just fix the situation, if you could just do this, 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 bring me something big, God, because right now I'm just not sure if I can believe in you right now. And I don't think that's the purpose of signs and wonders. The purpose of signs and wonders is to draw unbelievers to him. And so I think part of the reason that we're not seeing a lot of signs and wonders nowadays is because we're asking for the wrong things. We're asking selfishly. We're asking for ourselves. When God wants us to ask for them, for the unbelievers. Can you imagine if, thank you for this cough drop, my life has changed. (laughs) I don't know why I didn't think of that. Um, Can you imagine if we get to, if um, we get to Easter, the Easter Carnival, and something amazing happens. Like, I'm talking like the sky turns blood red only over this place, only over the church. Like, it's rain, or maybe it's, it's rain. Yeah, <laughs> that's a little scary, but whatever. <laughs> I think it's cool. <laughs> what, about, what about this? 
It's pouring rain on Easter. But the only place where it's completely sunny is right here. That's a, that's a miracle. That's a sign. And it, you know what it would do to the people who came here on Easter who were unbelievers? They would look at it and be like, what is going on here? There's something different about this place. There's something cool going on here. And that's what we want, right? So I want to challenge you guys. And I'm going to have you, why don't you all stand? Stand with me. We're going to pray. Because I want that. I want it really, really bad. And I think you guys do too. I want to experience signs and wonders. But we can't be asking for ourselves. Lord, we want, to, we want God to send down signs and wonders so that unbelievers can finally say, maybe there is a God. Maybe it's true. So then we can preach the gospel to them. So with every, every head bowed, every eye closed, would you raise your hand if you, just, if you want that? How many of you want to experience signs and wonders for unbelievers? Yeah, all of us. Let's pray together, and I want you to pray with me. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead out, but I want you to pray with me. This is a seeking moment. This is not just Pastor Christian praying from the front and everyone listening. This is every single one of us praying and seeking and asking God, send signs and wonders for unbelievers. Can we do that? All right, let's pray. Jesus, this is what we want We want to see signs. We want to see wonders. Lord, I know you can do it. I know you are capable. I have seen it throughout your scriptures, and I have seen your desire to bring the unbeliever back to yourself. That is your desire. That is your heart. That is your love. And so, God, I say bring it. Bring your signs. Bring your wonders. Bring your miracles. Bring your healings, Jesus to this church. Lord, I want to see it. I want to see your glory. We want to experience you in a way we have never seen you before, not for ourselves, but for unbelievers. And Lord, we just just repent of any times that we've sought these signs out of our our own unbelief. We don't want to see them for ourselves. We want to see signs and wonders so that many could be saved, so that all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus could be saved. And Lord, I I pray you would give us courage. I pray you would give us courage that when these signs come, or maybe if they don't, to speak Speak the gospel message to all who can hear. Lord, we do not want to just see the sign and then just leave people wondering, well, that was cool, now what? No, that was cool, and this is Jesus. Let me show you how you can be friends with him. Let me show you how you can make him Lord of your life. So, Lord, we commit as members of the body of of the body of Christ, as Christians, and we say, Lord, we will share your gospel with others. We make it just a point, a, a point of priority in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. And um, <laughs> with <coughs> excuse me. With every head bowed and every eye still closed, is there anyone in here? Maybe today is your day. Maybe today is your day to say, this Jesus that I've heard so much about, this Jesus, maybe today was the first time you heard about it. I want to make him the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to be a Christian. If there's anyone like that in the room or online, would you raise your hand today? just to let me know. Okay, yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand and that one. Good. All right, we're going to take some time to pray. 
the way you become a Christian, the way you follow Jesus is you turn, just like Peter says, you turn from your sins. You say, I don't want to live that way anymore. You turn to God. You turn to Jesus and say, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And then you let him lead. You make changes in your life. You start saying, I don't want to live in sin anymore, so I'm going to change my behavior. Lord, lead me. And that's it. So again, with every head, every head bowed, every eye closed, let's all pray this together. And if you're praying this um, for the first time, or maybe it's a recommitment, really speak to the Lord, and we will all support you in your prayer. Say, Jesus, Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. I know I'm a sinner. And I regret what I've done. But I know that you were greater. And you died for my sins. And I accept that sacrifice. So I turn from my sins. And I turn to you. And ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. And Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, would you just let us know? There's a connect card right in the, uh, in the seat back in front of you. Just check the little box that I made a commitment to follow Christ today. We want to follow up with you, not in a creepy way. It's just this is, a, this is the walk of Christianity. You should not do it alone, okay? We are all friends. We're all brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. All right. God bless. I love you. Thank you, Pastor Christian, for that great message. I hope everyone has been filled up with the Holy Spirit today. Um, we will have together nights today at 6 p.m. There is something for everyone, so please do join us. If a few people could stay and help, that would be great. And we will see you guys either tonight or on Sunday. Thank you.